Hello and welcome back to the final speaker for today and for Sparks 18. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Heckman. Jessica is a postdoctoral associate at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. She received her PhD in animal sciences from the University of Illinois, where she studied canid behavioral genetics. Previously, Jessica graduated from the Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. Her master's work was on the behavior and cortisol responses of healthy dogs to being hospitalized overnight. She also completed a shelter medicine veterinary internship at the University of Florida Maddie Shelter Medicine Program. Jessica is currently applying cutting edge technology to identify the genetic makeup that drives dog behavior. She lives with two dogs and participates in agility and canine parkour. Please join me in warmly welcoming Jessica. Thanks so much. Um, and so my, my hosts, who I have really appreciated hanging out with these past few days have been trying to get me to sing. Apparently, instead of, uh, so I'm thinking I may just sing this whole presentation, but then I realized that was probably a bad idea. Um, so everybody's been talking about genetics all weekend, and I'm here to talk about those effects that we see that are so strong that sometimes they really appear to be genetic effects, but that aren't actually genetic effects that are actually due to the environment. And I wanted to start out by filling you all in on, on who I am, although Mia gave a lovely introduction. Um, so I, I went back to school at age 33 to become a veterinarian. At the time, I was really, really interested in animal behavior, and I just really wanted to know more, particularly about dog behavior, um, how dogs behave, how they go wrong. And uh, while I was in the middle of veterinary school, I had a revelation that veterinary school was all about fixing broken animals and that I was not so interested in that, that I was much more interested in uh, figuring out why animals break in the first place and trying to understand particularly the biological mechanisms that go on in the body. And at first I thought in the brain, but then I realized, you know, brains are hard to get at because um, we have this whole skull and it's not comfortable for somebody if we cut open their skull. So I realized that hormones are another really great way you can get uh, blood or even saliva, urine or feces, um, much less comfortable for the animal. Um, so I realized that I was just much more interested in figuring out how animals go wrong rather than figuring out how to fix them. Um, and so I, I did that master's in the middle of veterinary school and that was really the moment where I was like, yeah, I, I really wanna do a PhD. Um, and so after my, my fabulous year doing a shelter medicine internship, because I'm really interested in stress in dogs, it's a great way to experience what was going on with dogs in shelters. I came back to do my PhD and uh, and then was, was lucky enough to move on to um, now working with Eleanor Carlson, who you all hopefully saw speak yesterday, uh, with this really interesting data set full of pet dogs who are, who are great to work with. Um, but another really important part of my education was my dog, Jenny, who I have here for you to, to see, fabulously beautiful. And, um, and I don't want you to look at this picture and think that I was completely unaware while this picture was taken of how deeply anxious Jenny was at having the stranger take the picture. Um, he was there to photograph me and my other dog, who's very friendly with people, for a magazine. And after we'd spent a bit of time trying to get the picture that he wanted and having trouble doing it, because I had never trained my dog to hold me, my gaze for a long period of time while someone took my picture, um, which I should, I should go back and do, um, Jenny was on the outskirts asking if she could participate. And so we let her participate. And we got this lovely picture um, where you can see that she is in control of herself, but she's not very happy at this this gentleman pointing something in her face. Um, and I got Jenny specifically because, well, because I wanted another dog, but I chose her specifically knowing the depth of her issues because I'm really, really interested in uh, what it's like to live with a, a very fearful dog and, and just what those dogs are like. And she has been an amazing teacher for me. Jenny grew up not that far from here in uh, rural upstate New York on a farm. She was um, what, I, what we would call an oops litter, but I think it's sort of a those dogs do that sometimes litter. Um, and I don't believe that she had ever left her farm before at age 10 months, animal control came to the farm and said, you have too many dogs. I think they had nine dogs at the time. Um, you need to bring some of them to a shelter. And they brought Jenny and her littermate brother who looks a lot like her into this shelter. And um, 
because I did some work with that shelter later on, I was able to talk to some of the people who had taken her in and, and get a lot of details that a lot of people, uh, when they adopt shelter dogs, aren't lucky enough to have. And so I know that Jenny's human mom was very surprised when she brought her in to discover how anxious Jenny was and how fearful of strange people in strange places. She just didn't know that because Jenny had grown up on that farm. When I first brought Jenny home, she was so fearful that um, every time I touched her, she peed. And so we had this system where I would have to take her out to the backyard so that she could pee outside. And she just wanted to huddle on her dog bed all day. So I would um, crawl backwards, um, not looking at her, to uh, attach the leash to this little loop that I had attached to her collar so that I wouldn't have to touch her. And I would, I would take her outside. So that was what it took then. Um, and she does much better now. I mean, you can see that she's dealing with this total stranger in the house, taking a picture of her quite well. She's now, I've had her for uh, between six and seven years. And she's come along uh, massively far with a lot of management, a lot of behavioral modification, and some medication. So I'm going to be coming back to her throughout this talk. She's uh, been a very valuable example for me throughout my talks. So again, what I want to talk about is that genetics is super important, and we've talked about that a lot, but there have been a lot of questions from the audience about, you know, what does it mean? What, how does genetics interact with environment? And I think a lot of times we get an animal very young, we provide them with a really excellent quality of life, a lot of good care, good training, um, a safe environment, and yet the animal at some age, often uh, adolescence or shortly after adolescence, starts showing some unwanted um, and inconvenient behaviors, often fearfulness, which may then manifest as aggression. And a lot of people will say, well, it must be genetic. It must be genetically programmed because, you know, the, the animals, you know, if we know the animal's parents, perhaps they were fine. Um, but if we don't know the animal's parents, then we have doubts about them. And, you know, and we haven't seen anything happen. This animal hasn't had any trauma that we've observed. And so it's not a reaction to, to trauma. So what's the other the other option must be is that there's this genetic program that, that this fearfulness or this aggression was going to turn on at this age. And so I just want to talk about all the different parts of early life experience that um, I think it's hard for us to remember sometimes because we live so closely with our dogs. It's hard to remember that we don't know everything that goes on with them, that they have this whole world and this whole experience. Um, and some other speakers have talked about that. Dr. Ballantyne talked about that beautifully earlier today, that they have this whole experience that we're not aware of. And so they may have had experiences that have led them to develop some fears, then we may just have been completely unaware of those experiences. And in some cases, in, in most cases, I would say that is, is not to say that we're not observant or careful owners. It's often because there's no way we could have known. And so I'm going to talk about things that happen before we uh, bring our dogs home from the breeder. And in fact, things that happen while the dogs are still teeny tiny puppies in the nest with mom and the breeder is interacting very little with them, or even things that happen to the dog, uh, the puppy while it's still in the uterus. So the way I think to think about this is that um, very early in life, uh, a puppy brain starts out and a puppy body starts out sort of ready for anything. It could be in any kind of environment. It doesn't know what kind of environment it's going to be in. And so the, the puppy brain and body has to be sort of ready for anything, but you can't live your whole life like that. You, you can't go through life being prepared for either the world to be um, kittens and pie or for the world to be um, you know, atomic bomb, bombs and hand grenades. It's, you, you, you have to decide at some point, and this is part of growing up for all of us, you have to at some point start saying, this is what my environment is going to be like. And so in these little, little animals, um, no, not consciously, but their bodies and brains are making these decisions that start them down a developmental path in, in one direction or another. And when it's so early on like that, these teeny tiny little bumps can start you in one, in, you know, can bump you in a particular direction and have a much larger effect on you at that age than they would if you had that teeny tiny bump as an adult. Um, and so one uh, somewhat silly example is the story that we like to tell about the butterfly who waves his wing in Japan and you have a hurricane over in an entirely different hemisphere of the world. Um, so you can have a teeny effect somewhere and it just through chaotic effects starts building and building. And so if you think about you know, starting out on, a, on, a, on any journey, these tiny changes that you make early on are going to have massive effects later on in your journey. When you're an adult, farther down your journey, you can make tiny little changes. It doesn't matter so much. You're going to get pretty much to the same place you were going. But early on, massive effects. 
So some of the things that dogs need to figure out, I mean, these, this is the life that I think most of the people watching this offer their dog, right? Um, safe. No one's going to come down, pick you up, and eat you. Probably no one's even going to yell at you, hopefully. And you're going to have plenty of food. Perhaps we might say sometimes too much food. Um, these dogs are doing really well. And so early on, they're getting signals that they should develop in a particular direction to expect that their life to continue to be like that. There are, however, a massive number of dogs in the world for whom life is not like this. They have to be prepared for people to yell at them and throw stones at them and other dogs to attack them. And they have to be prepared uh, for food to be really difficult to find. Their bodies have to know that they have to eke out every possible calorie because they're not necessarily going to eat regularly. Very different from these dogs who are provided two squares a day and plenty of calories and you know you don't really have to metabolize those quite so efficiently as these dogs for whom you know this dog is really having a good day, right? Um, and then compare that to the daily life of these puppies. So these are the, the choices that dogs' bodies are making early on as they head out in that direction. And there's a bunch of different places that this information comes from. So I'm going to start out um, by talking about maternal effects, which I think is very important. And I'll go on to some other things that happen later on in life. Um, so for mammals, we invest in our offspring a lot. Right, compared to um, some species of sea turtle who lay massive numbers of eggs, and that's it. And they would like to pass on their genes just the same as we would, but they have a different, um, a different approach to it, different strategy. Their strategy is have lots of babies and hope that some of them make it, and a very small percentage will. Mammals take the opposite strategies. So mammalian females carry our babies within our bodies. That is a, just a massive expenditure of energy, not to mention lactation. Um, which is another massive expenditure of energy. And then we raise these babies often, I mean, in the case of humans for years, for years and years, um, for dogs still for a pretty solid amount of time relative to how long it takes that baby to grow up and to be functional. Um, so we put a huge investment into our offspring and therefore it's really in our best interests to have them succeed. We don't wanna put all this investment into a puppy. A, a mom doesn't wanna put all this investment into a puppy and have that puppy not do well. She wants the puppy to do well and to continue to pass on the genes. And so one of the things that um, mammalian parents and, and mammalian mothers do is to give information to the puppies early on to help them figure out what the environment's gonna be. Theoretically, that mom has been living in that environment for some number of years and has a lot of information about what's going on in the environment. The puppy just has a few weeks early on to make a bunch of these developmental decisions. And maybe that environment isn't going to you know, show its full variation during those few weeks. So it's really helpful for mom to give the puppy this information saying, okay, you know, this is the kind of environment, there's going to be plenty of food, no kids throwing rocks, you can settle down, just relax. Um, you know, put your energy into other places, but don't put it into being really fearful of things all the time. Or mom can say, this is a really scary environment and you need to be prepared to deal with a significant number of challenges that are going to meet you day to day. And um, one thing that I really want to emphasize is that a lot of times when we get a dog who's very fearful, um, you know, my dog Jenny, she doesn't fit into my home as well as she would. Uh, she fits in great right now. But it was a lot of work to get her there. And it's, I think most of us would prefer to have a dog that is adapted from early on to think this pet life is the normal life. This is the life I'm going to expect. Um, and so I just want to emphasize that if a dog is adapted to a different kind of a life, it's not necessarily a pathology. It's not necessarily that the dog made the wrong decision. It's that the dog made what maybe was the right decision for the information that the dog had when it was little. And then the environment changed and it was a surprise. And so we think about um, taking dogs off of, um, you know, village, going and adopting a village dog who has lived its entire life and not been well socialized to humans, um, living its entire life managing for itself. And then we want to bring it into a home that's a very different environment. And it shouldn't be surprising to us when that dog has some difficulties adapting. Um, but sometimes, the, the puppy is just getting misinformation. And so if mom was pregnant in a shelter, mom may be giving the puppy some information about, oh my God, this world is really stressful. 
Um, there's lots of noise. There's no one who loves you and takes care of you. It's a really scary place. You don't really know what to expect. She's passing that information on with all goodwill to her puppy. She has no way of knowing that the puppy's not going to grow up in this environment. The puppy is then adopted and goes home into a loving, safe home. And the puppy had that early information pushing, pushing him in a different direction than was appropriate. So not necessarily pathological, just a mismatch of the information that the puppy got early on with the environment that the puppy could expect to have as an adult. So how do moms pass this information on, right? This, I love this picture. When I found this picture, I thought it was perfect for maternal effects because it looks like mom is whispering secrets into the puppy's <laughs> ear. Um, so uh, science, that's not how it happens. I'm sure that's a big surprise <laughs> to all of you. So how does she pass this information on? Um, I really, really wish I could find a similar picture to this with a dog silhouette. If any of you out there in Twitter land know of such a thing, um, particularly one that's freely available that I could use in future lectures, I would love to have one. But this is a great picture, I think, to show how mom and baby are together. And so we talk about um, uh, prenatal influences, prenatal experiences. Um, intrauterine experiences. So this baby is in the uterus but is receiving information about the environment that the mom is in through the mom. And uh, I'm not going to go into this too much into, in this talk, but uh, notice that if, this is, a, if a, this is a female baby, then she's already making her, um, her eggs for, to produce her children. So there's actually three generations here together in this one environment, saving some information. Um, so what happens? So the, the mom has some information and she passes it to the baby through the placenta. And the, the placenta, this, this interface between the mom and the baby, I think we like to just think of it as just this connection that doesn't do a whole lot. And the placenta is a fascinating, really, really active, dynamic organ that is in itself, I like to say making decisions because I like to personalize things. Um, but at that cellular level, making a lot of decisions about um, you know, what's going on with mom and how much of that should I pass through to the baby. Um, and so it's, it's transmitting a lot of information from mom onto baby in, in a way that's um, at an appropriate time point where uh, just while that baby's brain is developing, it's getting information while the brain is still so young and so plastic that it can make some very, very early decisions. And just as a callback to what the, the point of this lecture is, that's a really early decision, right? And so when we talk about the importance of genetics, environment this early is very powerful. Um, you know, with Jenny, I was able to make some changes in her over time, but it took a really long time. So uh, some of the classic, classic story of in utero effects or prenatal stress is the Dutch hunger winter story, which some of you may have heard of. It's a beautiful class, uh, beautiful natural experiment. In the winter of 1944 to 1945, towards the end of World War II, the Germans blockaded part of the Netherlands. And this area of the Netherlands was unable to receive food shipments for that winter. I think it was like six to nine months. Um, and at some points, they fell to uh, rations of calorie, a caloric intake of only 500 calories a day. To give you an idea of how little that is, um, the UK's National Health Service current rec currently recommends that an adult human should have 2,500 or, or 2,000 or 2,500 calories a day. So this is a minimal amount of calories, barely enough to keep people alive, and in fact, not really enough to keep a lot of people alive. There was a massive number of deaths by starvation during that winter. And then the war ended, and the blockade lifted, and everything went back to normal. But what was really interesting though is that some women were pregnant during that hunger winter. And um, studies were done on their offspring. Years later, when these kids grew up, they found that these kids were at increased risk of obesity, cardiovascular disease, um, and even schizophrenia. So some really interesting changes. These kids hadn't themselves lived through this hunger winter. They hadn't experienced that trauma consciously. But they were receiving information from their mothers while they were still in the uterus, telling them, you're going to live in a terrifying world where we don't know if there's going to be enough food. And in fact, definitely, currently, there's not enough food. So this, this interesting finding that they experienced obesity, you can imagine that their bodies were saying, well, if there's not going to be any food, then I have to make every calorie count. But then when you give them plenty of food, how does their body adapt to that? Um, not as well as, as yours or mine. So what's actually happening to a, uh, a puppy fetus that's in its mom? 
Um, this is my favorite picture of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, otherwise known as the stress axis, because it actually uses a dog from my friend Sasha's paper. Um, so what's happening, uh, first of all, is mom gets stressed. So we'll pretend that this is Sasha's dog, uh, Sonia, who to my, my, my knowledge has never had puppies, um, but let's pretend that she is pregnant. And so she gets stressed. And I'm not going to go through the whole complicated access, although I do want you all to appreciate how complicated it is. Um, we, I, I frequently hear when I go to dog science seminars or dog training seminars, we talk about the stress hormone cortisol. And people have mentioned earlier today that cortisol is a very, has very complex effects. Uh, it affects a lot of different body systems. I am going to focus just on its effects on um, its use as a hormone that goes up to signal to the body that it's time to be stressed and to tell all the tissues in the body it's time to stop worrying about digesting and fighting off diseases and reproducing. It's time to start worrying about um, being prepared to deal with whatever challenges is coming your way. So we imagine that some stress comes into this dog comes into the brain, makes a hop to another part of the brain, goes out um, the, uh, some information in this hormone, ACTH, goes out into the whole body, comes all the way down to the adrenal glands, really interesting. Um, they're down by the kidneys and yet they have a massive effect on behavior. And the adrenal glands um, reduce, re release cortisol. Um, cortisol in dogs, corticosterone in rats, and so because of the different naming schemes, I'm often just going to refer to it in this talk as a stress hormone. Again, that's uh, an oversimplification, but I think for our purposes, it probably should be fine. Um, and sometimes I'll say cortisol. So cortisol is released, and then cortisol is in the body, sending those, those important messages to the body. But now we have this dog who's pregnant, and so cortisol is in the bloodstream, and it comes to the placenta. What does the placenta do? Um, the placenta actually has an enzyme in it that goes and grabs some of these molecules of cortisol and says, I'm going to deactivate you to a different format, um, to a molecule called cortisone. I'm going to deactivate you before I let you go into the baby so that you're not going to overwhelm the baby's stress axis. The baby will only get this inactivated version. But, um, and so for normal everyday stresses that mom is, is prepared to deal with, this enzyme can handle that. But if mom is super stressed out for a long time, like she's in a shelter, um, then the, her stress level is going to be high, and it's going to be high over a long period of time. And so cortisol is going to be up high for a long period of time. And when that happens, she's only made so many of those enzymes. There's only so many that her placenta knows how to make. And so at that point, the placenta is like, I'm deactivating, I'm deactivating as fast as I can, but there will be extras that um, extra molecules that it fails to deactivate and those molecules are able to go through and then the baby sees them. So what happens when the baby sees them? Um, the baby is at this point presumably developing her own very complex series of these, uh, these three steps in this axis. And as those are developing, the body is making those early decisions. Am I going to be in a stressful place and I need to be, have a really reactive axis so that I'm prepared to handle anything? Or I'm going to be someplace relaxed and I should use my energy for other more, more uh, effective things. And so this is sending a signal to the baby's developing stress axis at this time that there's going to be a lot of stress and you need to develop in a particular way. And so we do see uh, most of this work has been done in rats because we feel comfortable stressing them out and then testing the babies. Um, and so in rats particularly, we will see that uh, babies who come from moms who are stressed out um, during their pregnancy, we'll see that these babies um, do have a more reactive uh, HPA axis, this axis, that their cortisol levels tend to go up higher and stay up for longer. And some of that is because it's harder for that axis to turn off. And I'm going to talk later in this talk exactly about what that mechanism is. So some other things that happen, um, this is one of my favorite brain regions, the hippocampus, the red one here. Um, named hippocampus uh, seahorse, because uh, you can't see so well that it looks like a seahorse here, but it's a nice little curl like a seahorse. The hippocampus has a lot to do with learning and memory, has a lot to do with our ability to contextualize. 
um, really important for dogs to be able to contextualize, right? If, a do if another dog is barking at you in a dark alley and he's off leash and he looks really scary and your owner's not around, that's a context in which your dog probably should be taking that quite seriously. If another dog is barking at you across the street, everybody's on leash and your owner's saying, hey, no big deal, that's a good time to say that other dog is, is not something that I need to get really stressed out about. So the hippocampus is really important in that kind of um, contextualization, spatial learning, things like that. And um, so these, these baby rats who come from moms who were stressed while their rats were in the uterus, um, their hippocampus is not as good at making new cells. And the cells that it does make, um, neurons, I'm gonna show you a picture of a neuron in a few minutes, but for those of you who know, a neuron likes to make lots of little connections to connect to other neurons, which is how the brain sends messages around and gets all of its work done. And um, the extensions on the neurons in the hippocampus are not as large in prenatally stressed rats. And then uh, behavior is what we actually care about, right? So I can talk about changes in the hippocampus and it sounds super scary, but it doesn't really matter unless we see differences in behavior and cognition. And again, we really like to test this in rats. And we see uh, the differences in behavior. Uh, I have an, a picture of an open field test here. So you put a rat in this open space. Rats don't really like to be in open spaces because anybody could come down and grab them as Chris so beautifully described a couple of days ago. Um, so they like to hang out near the edge and rats that were prenatally stressed are more likely to hang out near the edge. Rats that were not prenatally stressed are more likely to be comfortable coming in towards the middle a little bit more and explore, which you know is adaptive, right? There might be good food in there. It's good to check that out if you know uh, that your environment is a safe one, which your mom told you. And there's effects on cognition as well. Um, the hippocampus, as I said, is a big one for helping you to understand context and space and um, sort of spatial relationships between objects. And rats who are prenatally stressed have more difficulty with that, with uh, mazes and that kind of spatial learning. So a uh, big question that I get asked a lot is, well, what does it, does the timing matter? Is it, you know, if it happens super early, it's okay, and it happens later, it's a problem. And of course, we don't know in dogs. We don't really know in humans. There have been some studies in humans. We've tried to look, but of course, we don't want to experimentally stress out human moms at specific times. So the best we can do is sort of ask people, what, what were you more stressed at some point during your pregnancy? So those aren't um, we can't draw really strong conclusions from those studies, but we have done those studies on rats. This is unfortunately a mouse fetus, but I hope you will forgive me because I think it looks a lot like a rat fetus. <laughs> um, yes, the timing in them matters. So they have a gestation period, uh, the rats, of about 23, 24 days. And it turns out that between days 14 and 21, in the uterus is that most important time where the stress has the, the strongest effect. And we can hypothesize that this is because um, earlier uh, the brain is just not mature enough. Like maybe that axis, that stress axis just hasn't gotten developed enough to respond to these hormones that are coming in. And perhaps later it's, it's mature enough to say, I've already gone down my pathway. I know what I'm doing. This doesn't matter to me quite, quite as much. So it seems that sort of later on is when it's important, but perhaps not in that very, very last bit. Um, but this could differ by species. And so far as I know, no one has done this study in dogs. Um, what the, my best guess about how you would do it in dogs, and by the way, I would love to do this if I can figure out how to do it without killing puppies, which is the really hard thing, um, is there are receptors in the brain. So when cortisol comes into the hippocampus, there are proteins that cortisol binds onto, that holds onto them. If that receptor isn't in the hippocampus yet, then there's no way that it's connecting to cortisol and seeing those effects of cortisol. So just looking to see at what age um, they start manifesting those cortisol receptors, I think would be a really great first step. Eleanor, maybe we'll do that. Can we do that with the data we have now? Yeah, actually we have some that we might be able to, so we'll be talking about that after this. You guys like it, right, when I come up with, with a new study. Um, plans on the on the fly. So that's timing. And then the other thing is type and amount. Um, so what type of stress matters? So when I was designing, I really wanted to study stress in dogs for my master's. And one of the problems I kept coming up with was some things are stressful to some dogs and not to other dogs. What I ended up studying was um, dogs being in the hospital overnight without their owners. And for most dogs, this is pretty stressful. They really don't like being away from their owners. Um, I think Mia mentioned at some point earlier that she had done this meta-analysis study in which she found that one of the most major stressors for dogs is being away for their owner, from their owners. But at one point, I had trouble getting enough dogs into the study, and so I started going around to veterinarians who worked in the clinic 
saying, hey, is your dog in today? Could I maybe just go film him and take a little saliva swab? And so this one ER doc who had her dog in all the time, um, the dog's name was Cordis, which is a part of the heart, um, said, sure, you can, you can use Cordis. She's been in lots of studies. So I went and this dog was sacked out of sleep. It was the easiest video to score that I've ever scored because it was like sleeping, 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 <laughs> sleeping, and her cortisol levels quite low. So um, that was not a stressor for her, unlike for other dogs. Um, some people find public speaking to be stressful. You can see I'm quite calm and not alarmed at all, and everybody will tell you that I was not anxious at all before this started. Um, so the type of the stress matters, and so for some dogs, you can expose them to certain stresses in utero and it won't be a big deal, and for other dogs, it'll be quite a big deal. There's some things I think we should stay away from, though, and you'll, you'll notice that I keep harping on being in shelters. I really don't like to see pregnant dogs in shelters. A lot of shelters will take the puppies out, um, and, and the mom and the puppies out when she gives birth, but leave her in there while she's pregnant, sort of thinking like, well, it's important to start socializing the puppies, but I think they start being socialized while they're in there, and I don't think they should be in there at all. Get them to foster homes as soon as possible. The amount also matters. Um, so we tend to think, oh, stress, that's bad, right? It's not bad, and cortisol isn't necessarily bad. It's bad when it's too much for too long. And so if you take your pregnant mama dog and you just wrap her in cotton and you don't let her have any sort of challenging experience at all uh, for the time that she's pregnant, those babies are going to grow up thinking there's absolutely nothing challenging. Well, they're going to get that little piece of information, which is going to interact with a lot of other information. But that piece of information will say to them, there's nothing challenging at all in this world. Don't worry about it. Well, that's not true. There are some challenges. Um, and so I feel like a pregnant dog should continue to experience the minor life challenges that she always experiences. She should be experiencing the normal life that her puppy is going to experience. Um, and you should be there to support her through them as you always would be. If something is difficult for her, you should be there to help her deal with it, but you shouldn't uh, put her in a glass bubble because that's not helpful either. And so in some of these studies in rats, actually they found that um, rats exposed to mild prenatal stress actually did better on some of these tests that I talked about compared to rats uh, from moms who had no prenatal stress. So type and amount matters. Um, be nice if we knew more. So when I first started going to uh, dog science talks, I uh, was introduced to this idea that the, your litter mates, the hormones from your litter mates really matter. And this study, these studies have been done in rats and a little bit in humans, but not in dogs, which is why I have a picture of some very cute rats up here. And the idea is that if you're a girl fetus and you have a boy fetus on either side of you in the uterine horn, then the, the boy hormones from the boy fetus are going to affect you and you're going to grow up to be a bit masculinized. And this has been proven in rats. And in fact, when I was um, researching for this and for a class that I'm teaching right now, I tried to look up for some modern papers that I could share with, with you folks and with my students. And I couldn't find any modern ones um, that really talked about just this. Because this was found, this finding is so old, it was first found in, I think, 78. And another paper that I found was 1981. Um, the papers that are working on it now are just sort of assuming we all understand this effect and doing this nitpicky little stuff about it, which is not going to be so interesting for you all to read. So these older papers say, yeah, that is, a, that is true. Um, that is definitely true. And these rats who are born, the female rats who have boys on either side, are masculinized and in rats. Um, there's actually a physical change, which is that um, you start out with your, your anus and your genitals very close together. And as if you are a boy rat, they separate more as your penis comes forward. And if you're a girl rat, your genitals don't come forward quite as far. And that's a way that you can use to sex rats and kittens and puppies um, to see what that anal genital distance is. And um, so farther in boys and these masculinized female rats, the anal genital distance is farther. They do have a vagina, but it's farther forward than in other rats. They have behavior differences as well, particularly mating behaviors, as you might expect, because these are reproductive hormones. So um, when a girl rat wants to be mounted, she um, does what's called lordosis, where she uh, dips her back. They do less of that, and they actually will mount other rats, um, which some female rats do do normally, but they do more of it. Um, there's also a very interesting paper that looked at play style, which I think is we're now starting to get more and more to things that are relevant to dogs. Um, play style, that they have this more sort of um, rough and tumble and play fighting appears earlier and is sort of more common in these masculinized female rats, and that's a more, uh, more of a boy rat play style normally. So there are differences in them. I haven't seen any papers covering differences in aggression in them, which again is what we would be really interested in in dogs, but there are behavioral differences. Um, and then another paper showed that what's happening 
In fact, that the, so the direction of the blood flow um, along the uterus goes from the, the cervix sort of farther into the body towards the ovary. And that it shows that the blood flow is picking up the blood from the first boy and um, transmitting it to the girl. And so it's not that, the, and this is important, it sounds nitpicky, but it is important. It's not that these boys are somehow passing their hormones directly to the girl, but it goes out to mom, into mom's bloodstream, and then back into the girl. And this is critical because, um, and we think this happens in humans as well, and, and rats and humans have a different type of placenta than dogs do. And so we don't think that this actually is possible in dogs. I haven't seen any studies looking at it, um, but I, we actually don't believe that there's a mechanism for it. All right, so be ready. I warned everybody beforehand, uh, but not, not you folks, that this is the most complicated picture that I have. Uh, it makes me crazy that no one draws just sort of simple, straightforward drawings, but I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, this is a placenta. So what we're talking about with humans and rats is what's called a hemochorial placenta. So here's mom's blood. It's red, so you can tell that it's blood. And here's the baby's tissues. And there's a single layer of cells between the baby and the mom, okay? So the blood, which is carrying these hormones now, can, those hormones can diffuse. Look how narrow that is. The hormones can diffuse right into the baby, so the baby's exposed to them. So now when we talk about dogs and cats, it's different. Here's the maternal blood vessel surrounded by other cells, and here's the baby, the, the fetal tissues. The hormones can't diffuse as far through, right? There's actually um, tissue stopping them from diffusing through. And so we don't think that that happens in dogs and cats. Um, does happen in cows. Uh, we call them free martins. And that's a, yet again, so cows, even more separated mom from baby, even more distance. And so the mom is not transmitting it in cows either. In free martins, if you have twins, a male and a female, um, they actually grow blood vessels in the, in the uterus that anastomose or connect to each other, and so they actually are passing the hormones directly back and forth. Um, and those, those girls are quite masculinized and, and um, can't reproduce. Farmers do not like them. Um, so those are the differences in the placenta types. So humans and rats, direct connection, diffusion, we think this probably does happen between litter mates. In fact, we know it does for sure in rats. Uh, but dogs and cats, no one studied it, but it seems much less likely that that would be the case. So for the people who are concerned about uh, a pu female puppy in an all-male litter, in an otherwise all-male litter, I would say probably not such a big deal. Um, but reproductive hormones are definitely important. I just don't think they come from the litter mates, and I think they can come from the mom. I did feel the need to talk about this. This is not my area of expertise. I study stress hormones. Um, so sort of a, a high-level overview of what's going on here is this idea that while you are in the uterus, the reproductive hormones that your mom exposes you to um, are, are setting you up so that later on, when you see them again in puberty, your brain knows what to do. And so if you receive exposure to different levels of them while you are in the uterus, then you are going to have um, different responses to them as an adult. Um, again, not something that's been looked at in dogs and not something that we can apply directly to what it means about aggression. Um, but I think something that could be really interesting to look at in the future, where there are different individuals um, pass reproductive hormones at different levels onto their puppies, whether their placentas are doing it, whether they just have higher concentrations themselves. I don't know any of that. I don't know that it is known, um, but it's certainly li very likely to be an effect on uh, puppy personality later on. So how your uh, hormonal systems develop when you're little is definitely one way that you are saving this information that your mom has passed on to you. Another way that you save information is called epigenetics. Um, so when we think of genetics, our DNA is this string of ACs, Ts, and Gs that can't change throughout our life. But what can change is how we use it. And so um, our cells are able to put marks on different parts of our DNA saying this cell is super important and you should totally use this cell. This gene is super important in this cell and you should use it all the time. And this one's not so important and you shouldn't use it. And that's because you know your DNA, it's just this one book, right? That you have just the one book. But you're, as you're developing, you know, when you're little, you're going to want to use certain chapters. When you're older, you're going to need to use different chapters. When you're little, you need the information about how to grow your organs. When you're an adult, you need information about how to reproduce and have another whole individual. Um, and so 
uh, our body makes these markers to say things like you're a kidney cell, you're a liver cell, you're a brain cell. But the other thing that epigenetics, even more than saying you're a kidney cell, a liver cell, or a brain cell, even more than that, the markers say, you know, you're a liver cell in this particular kind of environment. You're a liver cell in an environment where there's not enough food. Be prepared to manage the calorie intake. And you're a brain cell in a very stressful environment, so be prepared to deal with that. So these are markers that are put into the DNA of, um, of very small, uh, we know rats for sure, and humans, and, and we uh, are pretty convinced dogs, although I don't believe anyone's actually looked at that. In, these, in this particular system. Um, it's put in there very early on. We know that these markers can change throughout life. Uh, we've only studied them, uh, really discovered them fairly recently, and so we don't know what changes them. We know that they're a little bit slow to change, which is in line with my experience with Jenny, right? That she was one way, she's gradually gotten better, but it was a lot of work and very slow. Um, so this is coming from maternal effects, and this study um, famously um, uh, with rats where the mom rats are licking and grooming their babies and they're providing different levels of maternal care. So the moms, moms can either give um, a lot of maternal care, meaning that they, they lick and groom and they arch back nurse, they arch their backs, so the babies have access to their bellies, to their nipples. Um, and moms can either do that a lot or a little. And they're passing information on to their offspring when they do that, if they do it a lot. They seem to be saying it's going to be a less stressful world. And if they do it a little, they seem to be saying it's going to be a more stressful world. And again, we see these distinct behavioral differences between these offspring. And by the way, you can foster them, right? So it's not genetics. You can take one from a mom who uh, licks and grooms a lot, and you'd expect that rat to grow up being fairly um, unafraid of, of novel things. And you can have it raised by a mom who licks and grooms very little, and that rat will grow up with a very different kind of a personality. Um, and the way that is passed on is through epigenetic markers. So I'm going to walk you through this um, uh, kind of backwards. So, so these, these babies grow up with a more reactive HPA axis, and this is what we talked about before, right? So their cortisol levels are going to go up higher, and they're going to stay up longer in response to a stressor. And that is because the off switch for the HPA axis is in the hippocampus. So as your cortisol goes up and it reaches your brain, that part of your brain, the hippocampus is saying, oh, oh, it's high enough. We've reacted enough. It's time to turn it off. And it sends a signal back to the top of the stress axis to say, stop, enough. Turn it off. We can be done now. Um, and in these, these babies from the moms who don't lick and groom them as much, this off switch is very insensitive. It's insensitive because we talked about receptors before. So in the hippocampus, there's these receptors. And then when the cortisol molecules or corticosterone in rats float in and it attaches to these receptors, that's how the hippocampus knows that the cortisol is there. And what's happening is that there are, are um, fewer of these receptors in the rats who weren't licked and groomed as much. And so the hippocampus just doesn't know as easily that the cortisol is there, doesn't see it as well, and so it's not as easy for it to send that off switch. And that's because of epigenetics. So as mom is licking the baby, she's, the baby's brain is laying down epigenetic markers in the hippocampus, telling the hippocampus how many receptors to make. So it's this beautiful, beautiful, well-described mechanism. As mom licks more, there are fewer epigenetic marks placed in the hippocampus. This results in more of the receptors being made. This makes the hippocampus more responsive to the cortisol as it rises. And that makes it faster to shut off the stress response, which, which results in an animal that is just more able to deal with stressful situations and with novelty. Um, so maternal care in dogs is where that brings us. We know it really, really well in rats. We're really interested in it in dogs. It's very new for people to have started studying this. There are a couple of interesting papers out by Emily Bray. Um, small sample sizes, this is new. We don't want to, to take too much away from it, but some interesting work, and I'm so glad to see people starting down this path. She looked at guide dogs, so they were in a controlled environment being raised in a guide dog school. And she actually found the opposite of what she'd expect. She did find that there was variation in the moms, and some of them were more attentive to their puppies, and some of them were less. She found that the moms that were more attentive, their puppies were less likely to succeed at becoming guide dogs, which we find a little bit surprising. Um, and she found that one of the particular differences most strongly correlated with whether those puppies would become guide dogs or not was whether the moms sat up 
and allow them easy access to the nipples. The puppies who, as you think that would be a good thing, but the moms who tend to lie on their stomachs, the puppies couldn't get at the nipples, those puppies were more likely to succeed as guide dogs. And we hypothesized, or, or Emily, uh, Emily Bray hypothesized in her paper that this is because we have a population where they're giving such good maternal care overall that just having that little bit of challenge, when we talked about how a little bit of stress is important, having that little bit of challenge may have made the difference to help these dogs. So just a, a quick uh, preview of what I'm going to talk about after the break, uh, socialization. So after we get away from mom and we get on, we go home and we've left the breeder and we're, we're with our new home and we have this really important period where the dog has to learn what's normal and what's not. Something that my dog Jenny really, no one ever did this for her. She never learned what was normal. And so when she left her farm, she was like, I thought the world was an acre in size. Who knew there were all these people and cars and things. Um, we believe the dog's primary socialization period is about the first three months of life. The early bit is more important, and I'll talk about that after the break. For anyone who hasn't read this book, these are the folks who first defined this. I strongly recommend this book to people who are interested in guide dog behavior, uh, guide dog, in dog behavior and dog socialization. It is a good read despite being from the 50s or 60s, and it's just chock full of interesting information. So this is a time period when the dog is making a whole lot of associations, good or bad, it's up to us to make sure that they are good associations. So, but the interesting thing is that these, these puppies are making these associations more powerfully and more easily during this age than adult dogs are, right? Socializing a puppy is powerful. Socializing, socializing an adult dog has some effect, but nowhere near the same effect. Why is that? Um, and we do have some ideas about that, and so I will talk to you about that after the break. So in a few minutes, I guess we'll be back for our Q&A.